The title of this book is Weird Against the Modern World, of course. What is the weird, and how does this complex, multifaceted spiritual concept, which is often visualized as a web or as a vast ocean, fit into your larger argument against the modern world? Right. So I'm using the concept of weird in two complementary ways. In the first sense, weird implies fate or predetermination. Unsurprisingly, the philological record suggests that weird as a concept and a word in Anglo-Saxon and Norse culture was heavily influenced by the Christians. Thus, a potentially alien understanding of an omnipotent and omniscient creator who had designed things to unfold in a particular manner becomes embedded in the idea where it may not have been in its original sense. As we know, for ancient Germanic people, there are three entities who weave the pattern of the universe, one which contains the fates of the gods as well as humanity and the world itself. The word weird itself is a cognate of one of these cosmic weavers. So we might say that the idea of predestination was not totally absent in pre-Christian understandings of the word, but it certainly took on a much heavier meaning later on. On the one hand, then, I'm deploying weird as fate against the modern world in the sense that climate change and the devastation it will bring cannot be avoided. Industrialism and modernity was always going to lead to global catastrophe, and there is nothing we can do to avert its course. We've got 500 years worth of consequences coming at us, and the idea of mitigating or avoid the horrors it will bring is just silly, if forgivable granted the scope of the disasters that are coming. Climate change is our fate, our destiny, and it cannot and should not be avoided. Incidentally, I will add that as no one precisely knows what the future holds, I suppose it may still be that the maniacal Elon Musks of the world will somehow design some sort of inconceivable machine. One hears, of course, of such fantasies as the singularity. Suffice it to say that if such a thing comes to pass, and a miraculous technology allows us to put off the return of equilibrium brought about by the coming storms, we will not have done ourselves or the world any favors. The price for such a thing will be unimaginable in ways that we almost certainly will not be able to predict. To extend the life of this culture will mean the extension of the abject suffering and meaninglessness of billions, and assuredly the displacement and extinction of countless more species. An artificial reprieve would be no blessing at all. The second sense in which I use the word weird is as a cosmological worldview in its own right. Weird does not merely suggest the existence of an irresistible and irrevocable path for the unfolding of history. It also, in a related sense, suggests the unfathomable vastness of a web of creation. As a woven tapestry accounting for everything in the cosmos, in its relation to everything else, weird evokes the Tao, a totality that is perceived in the rustling of every leaf, in every drop of rain falling into a still pond, in every action or occurrence, in a wholly animated and vibrant world. This holistic vision, of course, is also a radical challenge to modernity, defined as it is by atomization and fragmentation. Where we have been conditioned to accept mechanistic roles, all too often determined by capitalism, weird posits for me a form of radical integration. Everything has its place, everything has its value, determined not by the marketplace or by this or that political institution, but by its participation in the glory of the cosmos, the glory of God. This meaning is also present in my use of Jung's understanding of the acausal. With the incredibly limited, modest means of perception available to us, we cannot possibly hope to comprehend the nature of interconnection in the world. When I say we here, of course, I refer exclusively to the moderns. Traditional people, I believe, had a much greater understanding of this web or oceanic sentiment to double back, both because they were constantly oriented toward the sacred and the cyclical, and because they accepted that they were not in control of their lives or the world at large. One of the most fundamental tenets of Taoist thought is that the more that is done, even with the very best intentions oriented toward the most noble goal, the worse the outcome is. There are few things I believe more fully. The less we do, 
in any possible sense, the better. In other words, a quietistic attitude, one that accepts all that is and occurs without seeking to disrupt the flow of time and history, is that which is in harmony with the nature of weird. What will come is what must come. Modernity, I would argue, insists upon the opposite. Humanity, by aid of superior organization and techniques, is capable of determining the course of the universe. What I get out of what you've written so far is that a great humbling is upon us. We moderns have lived in a way that is a great violation of the sacred bonds and cycles of the earth, which are actually cosmic in scale. There is a great deal of hubris in assuming we are progressing when everything seems to be coming to a head, ecologically speaking. In trying to properly assess the problem, one might take on a rather misanthropic position, believing that the earth is seeking some kind of vengeance on humanity. Is this view also the product of the very hubris that assumes we can fix climate change through our cleverness and ingenuity? Yes, I do absolutely think that misanthropy is not at all the point. One would have a hard time identifying a writer more hostile toward humanity than Robinson Jeffers, and yet his argument against misanthropy is the most powerful that I've read. In the poem Original Sin, he writes, quote, As for me, I would rather be a worm in a wild apple than a son of man. But we are what we are, and we might remember not to hate any person, for all are vicious, and not to be astonished that any evil, all are deserved. End quote. Obviously, to me, Jeffers understood the weirding path as well as any. I do not say that we can or should prevent human suffering, but to rejoice in it is preposterous. There is a kind of petulance involved in the position that the earth would simply be better off without us. As though, if we can't have things our way, then we'd rather not be here at all. In a way, the people who feel this way have still made the error in assuming that they know what is best for the world, rather than accepting it as it is. Now, of course, it may be that humanity will not survive what is coming in the next decades and centuries. And if this is the case, then so be it. But in the end, all of the thinkers who have inspired me have this in common, that they passionately insist upon the joys of life and the miracle that we witness every day in this world, regardless of the calamities that befall us. We are made of the same stuff as the stars themselves, and the light of the cosmos shines bright in us as in all things. The ways of the modern world have dimmed this light within us, but they cannot extinguish it utterly. As things reach their pinnacle, the opposite moment begins. As the modern world falls into its greatest catastrophe, the timeless world rises up again. And I do believe we are seeing some version of this occurring even now. As we head closer and closer to the brink, more and more people are beginning to recognize what has brought us to this point. In the end, more than anything else, I pity the misanthropes. To me, anyone who has stood upon a hill and seen the mist gather in the valley below, who has experienced the joy of sex, who has gazed deep into the terrifying abyss of the ocean, who has embraced their child, who has smelled the forest after a heavy rain, who has listened to the music of Bach, who has felt strong in their body, should know beyond the shadow of any doubt that they are with the divine spirit. Mm -hmm.